Good morning. Hope you're having a great week. It is, let's see, it is Thursday, June 8th, 6.02 a.m. Central Daylight Time, local time here in Oklahoma City. I am at home, if you can't tell. I've been home for a long time. I just checked, and it looks like I've been home since March 25th. So it's been a few months. Um, yeah, it's been like two and a half months that I've been at home. And that's the reason I haven't been uploading many videos for probably over a year, is that the rates have not been good. The expenses have been really high. And it's just... I haven't really felt like going and hauling loads that I'm just making company driver money on them. But, you know, I, I've said this before, I can't set it home forever. I do have, you know, a decent amount of money in the bank, but I don't have an unlimited, I'm not rich. I don't, <laughs> I don't have enough money in the bank that I could just set here forever. So we are going to have to get back out there and run, uh, over the road. So, uh, what we'll do is I only have two things that I plan on talking about in the video. The rest of the video is just going to be rambling. So number one is we're going to talk about what's happened since the last video, because that's what this channel is, is me video logging my trucking journey. Like pretty much everything I've done in trucking is covered in these videos. Um, and then after that, the only other thing that I want to cover or I plan on covering is what I'm going to do to get back out over the road. Uh, what I'm going to do when I leave the house. I do have a plan to survive this, you know, bad freight market. Because it's looking like this is not going to end anytime soon. And we'll probably talk about that. So, uh, what, what what's happened since the last video? I'm pretty sure the last video I uploaded, I was up in Grand Forks, North Dakota. I was up there for approximately two weeks trying to find a load. There were hardly any loads being posted. And what few loads were being posted were paying like around two bucks a mile on the full rate. What I was going to make after all the percentage cuts on those loads was like $1.30 a mile or less. Um, and I've talked about this before. In my opinion, the average operating cost for an owner operator is around $1.75 a mile. The average operating cost for a, a medium to large carrier is probably around $2.50 a mile. And running loads at $1.30 a mile, I, I don't like hauling below the average operating cost. The average operating cost being $1.75 for an owner operator, I don't like touching anything below $1.75. Um, I mean, I, I have been forced to on occasion but I don't, I try to avoid it if I can. Sorry, there's a gnat or something flying around and I finally got him. Finally, you know, had those ninja reflexes where I just went, Tah! you know, like that Karate Kid movie, just chopstick that, that guy. But, um, so yeah, I finally found a load that was paying well above market average. And it was paying like 270 around somewhere in the ballpark of 275 a mile on the full rate. I think what I ended up making on the load was about two bucks a mile. I had a deadhead from Grand Forks down to Fargo. I can't remember the name of the town. It was like five miles south of Fargo is where I picked the load up right off the interstate. And it went to a Quaker distribution center in Dallas, a food warehouse. I hate, I hate doing business with food warehouses. They have the most ridiculous expectations like you're not supposed to get there more than 15 minutes early for your appointment and like stupid crap like that. These places are usually like right in the middle of, you know, downtown areas to where there's nowhere to park anywhere remotely close to them. And they'll give you an appointment at like 5 p.m. and they expect you to be there in a 15 minute window. It's like, are you kidding me? I'm supposed to drive across a major metropolitan area at rush hour and arrive within a 15 minute window. And if I'm one minute, one second late, um, then, you know, it's like a $500 uh, fine. <laughs> and if I'm one minute early, then you'll make me leave and come back. Like, it's just, I hate dealing with grocery warehouses. Luckily, this one had all those stupid rules, but luckily when I got there, I got there like 45 minutes early because there was no traffic. I parked about an hour away and 
I thought that there would be, you know, a little bit of traffic early in the morning in Dallas and there, there was no traffic at all. I had no delays at all. And I ended up getting there like 30 to 45 minutes early. And the security guard told me he wasn't supposed to let me in. Um, but he said, you know, we're really slow today. So yeah, just go ahead and park in your door. Uh, so, you know, he, he went ahead and let me in. So there, there was, there wasn't a whole lot of drama with it. Um, pretty easy in and out. Uh, they did take the full like two to three hours to unload the trailer. And then after I got unloaded, I, uh, you know, deadheaded up to the house in Oklahoma City and I've been here ever since. So that pretty much covers what happened since the last video. Um, I did receive an email, somebody asking, uh, some agent was trying to get some business and they were asking me if I would haul a load from Edmond, Oklahoma, which is like the north side of Oklahoma City to San Antonio um, that was paying like $1.60 a mile to me. Like after all the percentage cuts, I would make like $1.60 a mile on a load. It was basically hauling max weight 44,000 pound loads of dog food. Uh, so yeah, I didn't even bother replying to that dumbass. Like I, I'm not going to get on a dedicated contract to haul some max weight dog... All right, so there's a whole bunch of negatives with that. Number one, it's max weight. Number two, it pays ridiculously cheap. Uh, number three is it's only a one-way run. I would have to find a way to get back from San Antonio back up to Oklahoma City. And that's not a very good lane. It doesn't pay very well to go from San Antonio to Oklahoma City. Uh, those are really cheap loads. So I'd haul really cheap down there and probably something even cheaper to get back up. And then... Uh, dog food loads. Uh, dog food is extremely like it's an extremely strong smell, and that smell will seep into the trailer. And your next load that you go to pick up, you might get rejected. If they walk into the trailer and smell that dog food, they might reject it because that smell will permeate whatever you put in that trailer. So their product, whenever you deliver it to the next location, will smell like dog food. Um, yeah, it's, hauling dog food is not good. It's it's it's. Landstar forbids uh, hauling of garbage, uh, and I, I suspect the reason Landstar doesn't allow us to haul garbage in their trailers uh, is because of the smell. Uh, like at USA Truck, I hauled recyclables in the trailer, uh, uh, cardboard, and it basically smelled like a dump. Like the cardboard that they put into the trailer, the bales of cardboard they put in the trailer, uh, it smelled like a dump. And the place I delivered it to smelled like a dump. And it's hard to get that smell out. Uh, I haven't seen a load like that at Landstar. I don't... I, at Landstar explicitly forbids hauling garbage i'm not sure if they consider um you know cardboard going to a recycling plant to be garbage it technically is garbage that's going to a recycling plant instead of a dump so if i had an agent offer me uh, a load hauling you know recycle cardboard cardboard to you know a recycling facility um, I would call Landstar, double check, and see if that was permitted before I hauled that load because I wouldn't want to get in trouble for it. But yeah, anyway, yeah, there's a whole bunch of negatives with that load, and I didn't even bother contacting Barney back over that stupid load because it, when somebody approaches me with something and their offer is way away from anything I'm willing to accept, it's just not worth my time to try to negotiate that. We're too far apart. It's just, oh, oh, it's going to be a waste of both of our time to try to negotiate that. His offer is ridiculous and it pisses me off. And if I come in with my offer, it's probably going to piss them off. They're going to think my offer is ridiculous. We're just too far apart to even start negotiations. So, um, yeah. So that's what's been going on with me. Been sitting at home. While I've been at home, I have done, I, I have had to deal with Landstar a couple of times. Uh, they called me up and I had to go do a random drug test. It's the first time I've ever done a random drug test in my life for any company, for any job ever. And I've worked 
like most of my life, I've worked at companies that did random drug testing. And I have never been selected for a random drug test until, um, you know, last month when Landstar called me up. So I had to go do that. The other thing, I dealt with trailer utilization for like three days in a row. It was so annoying because what the deal was, was trailer utilization hit me up and they're like, hey, do you have this trailer? And I was like, yep. And they're like, uh, yeah, we show you've been setting idle for a month. Um you know, uh, we want to give the trailer to somebody else. And I'm like, all right. And they're like, do you have a lock on it? Is it connected to your truck? And I'm like, yep, it's got a lock. It's connected to my truck. And they're like, well, can you disconnect? And I said, yeah, I'll have to, it's 25 miles away. I'll have to drive over there. And it's in a, uh, you know, uh, a paid parking area that is restricted access. It's gated. So uh, the gate is open during the daytime uh, when the business is open. So they can come in there during the business hours of like 6 a.m. to 4 p.m. to pick the trailer up. So we we talked back and forth and they said, OK, can I just give you give your phone number to the other driver and you guys can work it out? And I said, no, I'm not going to deal with that crap. And they said, OK, well, we'll contact the other driver and work it out and then we'll contact you back. And I was like, OK. And they never contacted me back. And then the next day, they did the same thing. They called me in the morning, asked, you know, when I could hook from unhook from the trailer and all that stuff. They said they would contact the other driver and get back to me. Didn't contact me back. Third day, same shit. This time, they actually did contact the other driver and contacted me back and said, yeah, they'll, they said they'll pick it up first thing in the morning. Because, you know, I told them they needed to pick the trailer up. Like, I was going to go over there in the middle of the night and disconnect from the trailer and just, like, park it along the roadway somewhere it's not supposed to be. And I said, they need to pick the trailer up first thing in the morning. Because I'm going to leave it in a... I don't have a second spot to put the trailer in. And I'm not going to sit out there and wait for them to show up and, you know, wait to unhook for them. I'm not going to sit out there for eight hours waiting on somebody to show up. That's the reason I didn't want them giving my phone number to somebody. Because I don't know if you've ever worked with other drivers... But these other drivers don't seem to understand ETAs. They don't. They have no idea when they're going to arrive somewhere. They'll be like, oh, yeah, I'll meet you there at 6 p.m. And you'll be there at 6 p.m. You'll hit them up and be like, yeah, what's going on? They're like, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'll be there any minute. And they're like 100 miles away, and they still have to do a drop before they come over there. They don't tell you that shit. And you'll end up sitting there for eight hours waiting on these dumbasses. So that's the reason I didn't want, you know, to deal directly with another driver sitting out there wasting my time waiting to you know do a trailer handoff but we got rid of the trailer and uh that's all that i've really had to deal with landstar while i've been home i have been contacted several times by agents trying to get me to haul loads uh landstar actually called me yesterday and uh asked me if i wanted a load out of Gunter, Texas. I don't even know where it was going. And I was like, no, I'm not interested. Um, I'm guessing that it was one of those SOS loads because it was Landstar that called me, not an agent. Um, but yeah, that's, that's all the stuff that I've been dealing with while I've been uh, at home trucking wise. And, uh, you know, that's, what's happened since the last load. So now let's, let's talk about like what I plan on doing to, to, to make it through this bad freight market. And let's talk about this bad freight market. Let me pull up the load board here. It's loading right now. There we go. All right, let's get down here. Where we got, where we got, Whoa. that one will work. Oh crap! It doesn't show that uh, I, the blur effect is knocking out. Uh, let me find something that doesn't have the blur effect. All right, this one does not have the blur effect. Okay, so you can see the rate per mile there. If it's if the if the video quality is really blurry, then it's either because the video hasn't had time to process the HD version, or your ISP, your cell provider or whatever, is blocking the HD version. 
Uh, but I'm going to upload this in 1920 by 1080, so you should be able to read everything on here if you zoom in. Um, but okay, let's look at this. So these are the hot markets. Now it, it's six o'clock in the morning. This is right around the time that the load board, you know, you start to see loads starting to get posted on the load board. Those early birds getting the worm. Uh, but the load board doesn't really start kicking off until between like 8 and 9 a.m. So we're looking at the load board when it's in an off time, but we can still look. So these are the hot markets. These are the total number of loads sitting on Lodestar, Lo, uh, Landstar's load board right now. And this is like total number of loads is like... Landstar describes their load board as a dirty board. Basically, the agents do not clean up loads. Landstar does not police the load board like they're supposed to. The agents do whatever the hell they want on the load board. So there might be one load that's posted a hundred times on Landstar's load board by several different agencies, and that load may not even be available. Like, it may have already been covered yesterday, and it's still on Landstar's load board 100 times. So, these are not accurate load numbers. These, they just, you need context, you need to understand, to, to kind of understand what's going on. I would say that, like, probably close to, I, I would say the actual number of loads on Landstar's load board is close to 10 to 20% of the actual loads posted. So if they have 100,000 loads on their load board, there's probably actually only 10 to 20,000 real loads. But anyway, so we look at the markets here. Uh, we got Houston, Texas has the most loads. Los Angeles, California is number two. Now, a couple of years ago, Los Angeles would be number one by 1,000 loads or more. Like most freight from like most of the shit that we buy here in the United States comes from China and other countries over there in the Asia Pacific area. And it comes in mainly through the ports of LA and Long Beach, the Los Angeles area. So that is, uh, and then it gets distributed from there across the country. That is the biggest port in the country by a long shot, usually. But, um, Shippers have been avoiding uh, California for two main reasons. Number one is uh, the port workers have been off contract since June, what was it, July? July 1st or June 1st? I think it was July 1st of 2022. The port workers have been off contract since then, which means they could strike at any moment. And they have done some work slow uh, slowdowns. They've done mass call-ins. Um, you know, they have been doing things while they've been off contract to disrupt uh, the flow of goods. Um, the other reason is AB5. AB5 went into effect the same week that the uh, port workers went off contract. And uh, AB5 created a tremendous amount of uncertainty in California because most of the port workers are contractors. And... Uh, there were a lot of uh, contractors that were like blocking the entrances to the ports in protest um, over AB5. Uh, you know, there, there was just a tremendous amount of uncertainty. And California has been like that for years. There's just been tons and tons of drama with the ports in California for several years. And shippers just got tired of it. These were like the straws that broke the camel's back and shippers started bypassing California and uh, Los Angeles fell completely off of this chart for over a year. Now they're Los Angeles is climbing back up on this chart. They're nowhere near where they used to be, but LA is back on the, the top 10 list of most active markets on Landstar's load board. But the rates, the average rate per mile is just really, really cheap. This is really cheap. These are the full rates. We get approximately 70% of this. So 
if the average load is two dollars and eighteen mile uh two dollars and eighteen cents a mile in Houston, Texas, so two point one eight times 0 point seven, a dollar fifty two a mile. That's below the operating cost of most owner operators. That means that the average load being posted in Houston, Texas is far below the operating cost of most owner operators. And that is that can be said for almost all of these markets. The average cost of load is below the operating cost of most owner operators in almost every market. California looks like it is probably it would have to be 250 a mile. 250 a mile is $1.75 a mile at 70%. So California's average load would be um, over. But that right there is very deceiving. Because the loads coming out of the LA market, you can find good paying loads that are going up and down I-5 or they're going into a bad market like Denver or Montana or something like that. But to find a load to get out of the LA area back east, anything going you know, further east than I-35, anything to get you to Texas or further um, is gonna be paying much, much cheaper rates than that. Those things are paying like $1.50 a mile, $2 a mile. They're really, really cheap loads. So this average rate per mile is very deceiving. Um, you know, if you're trying to run over to L.A. and then get something heading back over to the east, you're going to get screwed over. You're going to be end up hauling something really cheap. But it looks like every single one of these markets, the average rate per mile is below the operating cost of, the, of, of most owner operators. All right. Now let's let me pause this and let me open up uh, one of my searches here. I would open it up while the video was running, but sometimes this thing glitches out and it'll take me back to the login screen or something like that. And if it, I don't edit these videos, if it shows like my email address, username, password, stuff like that, then I'll just delete the video and start over. So let me pause it while I do it. All right, this is my Oklahoma City search. Let me see what parameters I got. Uh, max weight 45,000, minimum revenue 2,500, minimum rate per mile $3 per mile. And uh, actually, wow, we have a few results. So I have my destinations restricted. Um, let's see here. California, Idaho, Montana, Nevada, Oregon, Utah, Washington, Wyoming. So I have Colorado and Wyoming. No. What I have... Colorado and what other state do I have omitted from this? Huh. I can't. Is it Arizona? No, Arizona is in the southwest. Huh. Let's do the edit search. That would be a lot easier to... Alaska. Why didn't I think of that? So Colorado and Alaska. So I have all of the Southwest, all of the Midwest, all of the South, all of the Mid-Atlantic. Nothing New England, nothing Canada. New England is the deep Northeast. So there's actually a lot of areas listed in the destinations that I even, I, I, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't go. So this is showing like a lot of places that I would not go. I wouldn't take a load to California. I wouldn't take a load out west anywhere, out west. Um, and I wouldn't go anywhere up near Ohio or Pennsylvania or places like that. But we can look and see what's out there. So we got Tulsa, Oklahoma to Sumner, Washington. Max weight load, 42,000 pounds. Uh, can see gap, consumer goods or appliances. So it's generic. It's just general freight, three thirty a mile on the full rate, sixty five hundred dollars. So all of the prices you see here, that's what Landstar is actually being paid. I get sixty five percent of the line haul, hundred percent of the fuel surcharge, which comes out to somewhere around seventy percent of the load. So that 
$3.30 a mile, 3.3 .3 times 0.7, $2.31 a mile is what I would make on that load going up to Washington. And I would use a tremendous amount of fuel on that run. That's a lot of mountain driving. It's a really heavy load. Yeah. Prior Oklahoma to Pompano Beach, Florida, 318 a mile to go to Florida. If you remember not too long ago, I wouldn't even consider a load to go to Florida for less than $5 a mile. And even at $5 a mile, I wouldn't go there. It would have to pay well in excess of $5 a mile on the full rate for me to consider a Florida load. And now the highest paying Florida loads are just paying a little over three bucks a mile. That shows you how much the rates have fallen. Neosho, Missouri to Salt Lake City, Utah, 335 a mile. All right, let's see. What's the best paying load we got on here? 413 a mile. Wichita, Kansas to Carlsbad, New Mexico, which is out in the middle of nowhere. Max weight hazmat load, 44,000 pounds of hazmat, paying $4.13 a mile. This is a terrible load. So yeah, all of these loads, and here's somebody trying to move the exact same load for $3.98 a mile. Wichita, Kansas, Carlsbad, New Mexico, 44,000 pounds of hazmat. And there's two results on that. Oh, crap. I forgot to turn the blur effect back on. Uh, there we go. Now the blur effect's back on. The blur effect is there to try to block out the phone numbers of the Landstar agents. Don't call them unless you're list, you know, leased to Landstar. Um, they don't want to like hear from you if you're not leased to them. And you're not getting these rates if you're not leased to them. If they post one of these loads on the spot market, they're not going to be at these prices. They're going to be much, much lower than these prices. Because these prices you're seeing on here are the actual prices that Landstar is getting paid for these loads. And they're going to take at least a 30% cut on it. You're probably, if you if they reposted one of these loads on the spot market, it would probably be at 50% of the price you see here. Um. Yeah, all these loads suck. They're all going to really bad areas. Wait, wait, wait here's one going to... Murfreesboro, Tennessee. Mesquite, Texas. I don't know where Mesquite is at. Let's check and see where Mesquite's at. Let's look at a map. Okay, let's see what we got here. Oh, it's got a whole bunch of stops on it. Yeah, Dallas, Texas to Nashville, Missouri. Or Nashville, Missouri. <laughs> Nashville, Tennessee. Um, the pickup and the destination are two really good places. But the reason it's paying decent is because it has a whole bunch of stops on it. I didn't notice that. So that's a shitty load. If it didn't have any extra stops on it, that would be probably the best load on here. You know, St. George, Utah is out in the middle of fucking nowhere. It's... I think it's like 150 miles or 200 miles from Vegas. Vegas is not a very good freight market, but Vegas is the nearest place to get freight from St. George, Utah. All the rest of these areas are really bad freight markets. So yeah, that's... All these loads suck. All right, let's take this down to 250 a mile.
two fifty a mile is right around where like your really good loads are at right now. Like a load that's going from a decent market to a decent market and it doesn't have any bullshit like max weight hazmat or 15 extra stops on it. That's right around what the, you know, the majority of those loads are paying like $2 a mile or less on the full rate. But the really good ones, you can find them up around $2.50 a mile. Which leads me into what the number two thing I want to talk about is what I plan on doing during this bad freight market. So the best loads that you can find on the load board are right around 250 a mile, which if you do the math on that, 70% of that comes out to about $1.75 a mile. And you're usually going to have to wait a few days in between loads uh, to find your next load because these loads are not very common. You're either going to haul cheaper than that or you're going to be waiting a few days in between loads, maybe a week in between loads, uh, or you're going to be running at a lower rate per mile than that, or you're going to have huge deadheads. Uh, basically what it boils down to is you're not going to be operating at $1.75 a mile on all your miles. You're going to be operating well below that because of setting or deadheading or having to accept freight cheaper than that uh, so that you don't set for long periods of time. So let's talk about what I plan on doing. Let me bring out my spreadsheet. What am I going to do to make it through this bad freight market? Uh, all right. Now, if you watch all my videos, then you're familiar with this spreadsheet. Because I created this spreadsheet on a video, I don't know, a year and a half ago? It's been a while. So, what it was, was... I was going to give like a dedicated run or a contract run a try and see if I liked that better than hauling just random loads because hauling random loads, I would end up sitting at the truck stop for long periods of time. And I don't really have a problem sitting at the truck stop for long periods of time, but whenever I'm sitting at the truck stop trying to find a load, it's not like I'm just sitting there hanging out, playing video games all day long. I'm usually spending the majority of my day looking through the load board like we were just doing, you know, looking at loads, looking to see where exactly it's going, extra stops, figuring out, you know, actually how much money I make, what's the deadhead on it. As loads are being posted on the board, I'm going in there and looking at them to see if they're decent loads. I'm checking the market that it's going to to see what kind of loads I can get coming out of there. So I would spend like eight hours a day looking through the load board. I was actually working on those days that I was sitting there at the truck stop. So I thought, you know what? If I could find a dedicated run, even if it pays lower than what my average, you know, that I'm running at is, just that, you know, continual revenue without any deadhead, without any, you know, sitting around looking at the load board for eight hours a day, five days a week, you know, that's 40 hours a week I was spending working and not getting paid. Once you factor all that stuff in, it's like, man, I could run at 50 cents a mile less and uh, make a lot more money than what I'm doing right now. Be a, you know, a, a lot more fruitful with my time. So there were two runs that I started looking at that I could do, two contract runs. One was from somewhere in Kansas. I think it was near Kansas City, and it was going up to, I think, Portland, Oregon. Um, and then there was a second load they had coming, you know, back from somewhere south of Portland back over to Kansas somewhere. Um, but it was uh, a dedicated, well, not, well, I, I wouldn't say it was a dedicated run. It was a contract run that they had every week, and I could do it every single week. I talked with them about it. And uh, that was one of the runs, which is, where do I have it up here? 
I can't remember. I don't even think I have the information for that run on here anymore. But I was the re I created this chart to compare that load versus a Hobby Lobby dedicated run shuttling containers between Oklahoma City and Dallas. And the way it worked out was that I decided the Hobby Lobby run was the better of the two. Once you factored in fuel prices and deadhead and, uh, you know, all the mountain driving and all that stuff, uh, all the weather I would have to deal with in the mountains, I would make a little bit less per mile on the Hobby Lobby run. But uh, after you factored in all the fuel cost and everything, the, it, they paid very, very similar. And I would much prefer to just go back and forth between Oklahoma City and Dallas than to drive all across all those mountains up to Washington or Oregon or wherever it was at. So let's go through this and let me explain to you what this is. So the Hobby Lobby run, I did it. I did three loads, I think three or four loads, and I was like, I'm not, I don't want to do this anymore. Because I figured that I could do a maximum of nine loads per week on the Hobby Lobby run because it's 440 miles round trip, 220 miles one way to uh, go from the Oklahoma City Hobby Lobby terminal down to the Union Pacific Rail Yard and then across the street to the Hobby Lobby terminal in Hutchins, Texas, and then back up to the Oklahoma City Terminal. It's almost exactly 220 miles one way or 440 miles round trip. So I thought, you know, I could do up to nine runs per, per week because if you do the math on that, 440 times nine is 3,960 miles. And legally, the most miles you can do in a week um, in a truck that you're going a maximum of 65 miles per hour in is I think it's somewhere around 4,250 miles in a week is the absolute maximum miles you can do in a week legally. So 3,960, that's, you know, should be doable. Like you should be able to do close to 4,000 miles in a week solo if you do not have any wasted drive time, which if you're on a dedicated run like this, where you know exactly where you're doing, exactly where you're going, you know, what's happening, um, then you should be able to get close to that 4,000 miles per week. So I figured maximum loads, nine. Now that's in a perfect world. I'm probably gonna hit traffic delays and there's gonna be delays. So nine was my maximum. And where do we got this at? Uh, let's see where this is pulling from. N16 and M15. N16 and 15. Okay, so this is where it's pulling from. So let me put a nine here, and this is the number of loads per week, and that's going to change all the rest of this stuff. So if I did the theoretical maximum of nine loads per week, that would be $6,975 gross to the truck. Almost $7,000 a week gross to the truck. That's pretty damn good. Well, my total mileage right here, 3,960. Actually, you know what? Uh, these numbers are off because uh, the load used to pay more than it does right now. It used to pay $840 per load. Now it pays $775 per load. And all the numbers I have in there right now are for the current pay, what it pays right now. So... Um, it was, it was like it was more like a dollar ninety one per mile. Now it's like a dollar seventy six per mile. So this is a theoretical maximum for what it pays currently. It used to pay significantly more. Um, so right now seven thousand dollars gross per week to the truck, four thousand miles a week, paying about a dollar seventy five a mile. And I estimate on that particular run, I should be able to average eight miles per gallon. Half of the load is hauling an empty. So you're taking empties from Oklahoma City to Dallas, and then you're bringing a loaded container from Dallas back up to Oklahoma City, and the containers usually don't weigh very much. 
they usually weigh a maximum of around 20 to 25,000 pounds. So eight miles per gallon average should be easily doable considering that I don't drive faster than 65 miles per hour. If I were driving 70, which is the speed limit, um, this miles per gallon would be uh, lower. Um, so that would be roughly 500 gallons of fuel per week. And with the pump price being 296, well, let's change the pump price. I just checked it. And right now it's 270 a gallon is what I pay for fuel. Actually, wait a second. Let me, let me think here. Um, that's with the IFTA and the fuel discount and everything. Yeah, that's the raw fuel price. Is that what I want to use? No, that's not what I want to use. Let me pause this. Let me look up the fuel fuel price here on the app real quick. All right, so 270 is what it is uh, without... Uh, that's that's with without talking about the... That's with everything removed. My discount, the IFTA tax credit and everything. Let me actually check Texas. I just looked at Oklahoma. Let's check Texas. Uh, where's where's the one in Denton? Because it's the same price, but they have different taxes. Yeah, so it'd be two ninety a gallon. Um, all right, so let's put this at two ninety. We'll we'll leave the if the tax in there because I have to pay that. Um, whether I pay it at the pump or they charge me later for it, I pay it no matter what. So let's leave that at two ninety a gallon. So my fuel cost per week is going to be one thousand four hundred thirty five dollars and fifty cents per week. My maintenance cost, which is factored in at eleven cents per mile, it's basically taking the mileage and multiplying it times point one one, four hundred thirty five dollars per week, and then my fixed costs are three hundred sixteen dollars a week. That's my insurance and all that stuff. ELD equipment rentals and things. Um, so my net revenue, what I would take home, what I would pay myself after all of my expenses would be $4,787.90 per week. You know, $4,700, $4,800 a week. And what I would make would be $1.21 per mile. That's how much I would actually make is $1.21 per mile. But that's doing nine loads per week, which is not possible. Because after I started doing the loads, I realized how much wasted time there is. The Union Pacific Rail Yard is absolutely massive. The Hobby Lobby Terminal in Oklahoma City is also absolutely massive. So you waste a tremendous amount of drive time driving around at 10 to 15 miles per hour at both of those terminals driving you know from the check-in place all the way to where you park the trailer and then all the way back out you waste at least 30 minutes of drive time per load at each of those locations then on top of that I used a tremendous amount of on-duty time because of issues with trailers there were a lot of delays with, you know, trying to find a trailer that could pass an inspection, trying to find an empty to take back down to Dallas. Uh, all of the trailers, I, I, I don't think I ever hauled a single trailer that could pass an inspection back down to Texas. I was so afraid of getting pulled over with every container I hauled back down to Texas uh, because they all had major issues. Like, one of the trailers, this was the best trailer that I could find in the empty lot in, in Oklahoma City at the Hobby Lobby Terminal. The best one I could find had brittle air hoses. And I heard a minor leak coming out of the air hose. And I went and I grabbed a hold of it and I pulled it to my ear. And I started feeling around. And the air hose started crumbling and cracking and crumbling. And the leak got a lot worse. And I went and got Gorilla Tape and taped around that airline to get it to stop leaking. Now I reported the issue whenever I, whenever you turn in the container at the Union Pacific Rail Yard, it's all done on a computer. 
and you can report issues with the container or the chassis. And I, every single one I dropped off, I had to sit there and report issues, go through their little list of, you know, and then type out what the issue was and stuff like that. It's a very time consuming process. But yeah, there's a, just a tremendous amount of wasted time on these loads. And there's an extra stop on it. You have to stop at the Hobby Lobby terminal in Dallas. Because so, whenever, whenever you go down to Dallas, you go to the Union Pacific Rail Yard, and it's a long check-in process, long check-out process, huge terminal. You drop off the empty trailer there. Then you drive across the interstate uh, just a couple miles away to a, hobby lo a small Hobby Lobby terminal, and they have the, the loaded trailers there. They're Hobby Lobby drivers that just shuttle trailers back and forth between the Union Pacific Rail Yard and that terminal. So you go over there to pick up your loaded, and then you take your loaded up to Oklahoma City. So there's an extra stop, which takes up some more of your drive time and your on-duty time. So nine loads per week is not possible. It's just not possible unless you're lying on your log books and you're not inspecting equipment and you're just like, it's just not legally possible to do nine loads per week. Um, eight loads would be incredibly hard. Seven loads, it would be theoretically possible um, but you couldn't do that every single week because you're going to have to do a 34 hour reset at some point. You're going to run it out of your 70. So you could, by my estimation, the most realistic loads that you could do in a week is seven. And you can still take a 34 on that. So you could do seven loads a week if you're you know, really busting your ass and you could, you should be able to squeeze in enough time to do a 34 hour restart and still do seven loads a week. Um, that would be pushing it would be to do seven loads per week. Easily. You could do six loads per week and take a day off to do a 34, six, take a day off to do a 34. So let's do it based on seven loads a week. This is working six days a week doing a 34 on your seventh day and, you know, doing seven loads a week every week, just back to back to back to back to back. This is the theoretical maximum. Um, eight loads might be possible and still squeeze in a 34, but it would be very, very, very hard. Everything would have to go perfect. So let's just do it on seven loads per week. So how much could I make doing this load? So... Total gross to the truck, seven loads per week, $5,425. That's 3,080 miles per week. Rate per mile stays the same, $1.76 a mile. Miles per gallon stays the same, eight miles per gallon. So the gallons of fuel that I would use in a week would go down to 385. Uh, price stays the same. Fuel cost would go down to $1,116.50 per week. Maintenance cost goes down to $338.80 per week, $338. Uh, fixed cost stays the same at $316. So my net revenue, what I would put in my pocket at the end of the week after all of my expenses would be $3,653.70. What I would make would be $1.19 per mile after all expenses. That's with my costs. Now, I, I said earlier that the average cost for most owner-operators is about $1.75 a mile. And that's also factoring in $0.60 cents a mile to pay the driver. Well, I'm not factoring in $0.60 cents a mile to pay the driver here. So um, at $1.76 per mile, that's the operating cost of most trucks. Most owner-operators, if they were to run this load... This would be a break-even load for them. But because my operating costs are so low, because my truck's paid off, and my insurance payments are so low, and basically all my expenses are some of the lowest expenses you can get in the industry, um, I have some of the lowest operating costs possible in this industry. Because of that, um, if you take $0.60 cents a mile out of this to pay me, then what I would be able to put aside to the business would be 
59 cents a mile. So that leaves me with a cushion for that $15,000 breakdown that's eventually going to happen. I'm able to put 59 cents a mile aside in my chick in my uh, business checking account and pay myself 60 cents a mile easily out of this dollar 19 a mile profit that I'm getting. So, this is a profitable load to me. So let's let's take it down to 6 loads per week. Um at six loads per week, we're just going to look at the, the net revenue, what I actually make, my profit. Six loads per week. Well, what was it? Seven. Seven is 30, $36.50. $3,653.70 per week profit. Um, six loads per week would be uh, you know what? I could do a chart on here that just charts it all out. Um, let me think about this. That would be time consuming. I don't know if it would be worth it. It would kind of be nice to see it charted out. I could... the e <laughs> What I prefer to do when I'm working with Excel is automate everything. The easiest way for me to do it would just be to like punch in 6, see what it is, and then type it in down here. Punch in 5 see what it is, type it in down here, manually type in everything. But I, I like to automate everything so that I can just change like, you know, the input information and it updates everything. Uh, but anyway, okay, so six loads takes me down to 3,086. Five loads takes me down to 2,519. Uh, four loads takes me down to 1,952. So I could do four loads per week, basically work uh, three and a half days a week, and I could pocket $2,000 a week profit. Just working three and a half days a week, I could pocket two grand a week after all my expenses. Three loads per week. Takes me down to $1,385.30 profit. Two loads per week. That drops me down a lot. Because now the my fixed costs are starting to become a significant part of my... Uh, um, they're, they're starting to take a, a big percentage out of my revenue. So now I'm down to only making $0.93 cents per mile from $1.21 a mile when I'm hauling seven loads per week. And the fewer loads I do, the less efficient that that mileage gets because of my fixed costs. They're, my variable costs keep everything the same. It's the fixed costs. It's, it's That's the reason people with huge truck payments, you know, they're paying $1,000 a week truck payment. They don't really start making any money until after they've hauled two or three loads. You know, they're not making any money until they get down to the end of the week. Like that last load of the week is the only one that they actually make any money off of. All the rest of the week, they're just driving to pay on that, you know, to pay that truck payment and all the rest of their fixed costs. You know, there are people out there that have fixed costs that are close to $2,000 a week. So they have to make $2,000 a week to cover their fixed costs then they have you know the after that they still have to cover their variable costs like their fuel costs and their maintenance costs and things like that out of everything after that that's the reason most people fail as owner operator truck drivers is because it's just so incredibly expensive and the rates fluctuate wildly like right now the rates suck it's really hard to be successful if you don't own your own truck if it's not paid for or if you don't have a really cheap truck payment. Like, it's really hard to be successful right now. But um, this load, I can be profitable with this load because my expenses are really low. And uh, this is a load that I plan on running whenever I get back out over the road. I just got an email yesterday uh, from the agent asking if, you know, there's somebody available to run Wednesday through Sunday. They have, uh, they're looking for somebody to run Wednesday through Sunday on this load. 
So I plan on hitting this guy up whenever I feel like leaving the house. I don't know when that's going to be. Let's take this back up to seven loads. That's ideally what I would like to do. Now, most of the people that run this load, they do home daily. They, you know, start early in the morning at like 5, 6 a.m. They go pick up a container. Uh, they take it. You know, there's two ways that you can do this load. You can either start in Oklahoma City or you can start in Dallas. So there are people that start in Dallas. They go from Dallas to Oklahoma City back to Dallas. And then they go home. Or there's people that start in Oklahoma City. They go Oklahoma City, Dallas, Oklahoma City, and then they go home. Stay the night at the house, come back and do it all over the next day. That's not the way that I run this. Um, it is a tremendous amount of time for me to commute back and forth between the truck and my house. It's a 25-mile drive. Um, and then, you know, whenever I leave the truck, I have to prep the truck for me to be away from it. Whenever I leave the house, I have to prep the house for me to be away from it. So there's, you know, 5, 10, 15 minutes that I have to, you know, do things in the truck to prepare to leave. 5, 10, 15 minutes I have to do things in the house to prepare to leave. And then all the time spent commuting back and forth. So you're talking about a couple of hours per day, two to three hours per day, just for the convenience of, of spending the night in my bed at home instead of the bed in the truck. Well, instead of commuting back and forth for two or three hours a day, why not just spend that two to three hours turning around and driving back down to Dallas? So what I do after I get back to Oklahoma City and I drop the loaded trailer off, instead of driving, well, that that's another thing to consider is that it's around... 15 miles from the Hobby Lobby terminal to where I parked the truck. So I also have to drive 15 miles there to park the truck. So that's an extra, you know, 20 minutes or so. And then I have to drive another 15 miles to get back over to the Hobby Lobby terminal when I start my day the next day. That's another 20 minutes or so. You're talking like three-ish hours of wasted time just so that I can sleep in my bed at night instead of the bed in the truck. So what I do instead of doing all that you know, coming to my house, spending the, the night at my house every day is after I drop off the loaded or yeah, the loaded trailer at the Hobby Lobby terminal in Oklahoma City, I immediately pick up an empty and I turn around and start heading back down to Dallas. And I usually stop right uh, around the, uh, uh, the, the border of Oklahoma and Texas. So I'll drive two or three hours back down to uh, toward Texas and then I start the next day from there. So um, that's the, whenever, whenever I do this run, I run it like I'm out over the road. I could run it as a home daily, but it's incredibly inefficient to do it that way. There's just a huge amount of wasted drive time, whether that be in the truck or in my personal vehicle. It's just a two to three hours of wasted work that I'm not getting paid for every day just so that I could sleep in my bed at home instead of in the truck. I don't see that as worth it. So the way I would do this run is I would go out and I would just run it for like four to six weeks. And then I would come home for two or three weeks and then go back out for four to six weeks. So how much could I make in a month? If I were able to do seven loads per week, um, gross net, what, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Monday, uh, okay. Let's put it right here. Um, well, I have it set up here. Like, how much would I make if I did this for 17 weeks? How much for 39 weeks? So 17 weeks is roughly how many weeks I work per year. 17 weeks per year is... Um, that's... Let's see. That's a little over four months. On average, I work about three months per year. Three, three and a half months per year is all I work per year. So the 17 weeks is close to what I work per year. 39 weeks per year is what your average person normally works. Like, not a truck driver, but like a normal person. Truck drivers work like close to 48 work, you know, weeks per year. You know, they only get a couple of days off every two or three months. 
uh, 39 weeks per year is just if you took weekends off. If you just took Saturday, Sunday off every week, you would work 39 weeks per year. That's not even including vacation or anything like that. That's just having weekends off. You're working 39 weeks per year. So if I took two days off per week doing this run, and I could do that in a lot of ways. What I could do is for every, you know, uh, week that I'm out, I take two days off. So uh, six weeks times two, that'd be 12 days off. So if I went out there for, and did this run for six weeks and then came home and took 12 days off, go out, run it for six weeks, takes 12 days off, that would be working 39 weeks per year. So these are the numbers that I would make on this run. So if I ran this load for 17 weeks, I would make $92,225 gross to the truck. That would be the total revenue of the business. If I did it for 39 weeks, it would be $211,575 gross to the truck. Now let's go down here and look at the net revenue, what I would actually make after all expenses. And this isn't even all expenses. This is all of the expected expenses. This is not including unexpected expenses. You still need to be putting money in the into your business account for that $15,000 unexpected breakdown. So $62,112.90 per year in my pocket is how much I would make after expected expenses doing this run for roughly three and a half week or three and a half months and taking the rest of the year off. If I ran it for 39 weeks out of the year, what I would make profit wise after expected expenses would be $142,494. Now, this is with my expenses. Let me uh, change the fixed cost from $316 to $1,800. Let me just make a note of what the fixed cost is over here because I'll forget by the time I need to type it back in. So if you had... Okay, so the reason I use $1,800 is because um, one of my CDL instructors quit his job as a CDL instructor after I graduated. And he decided to come back out and become an owner operator again. He'd been an owner operator before. And while I was in class, he and I talked about it a lot. And he decided to come back out and do it again. Well, he drove for a prime subcontractor, Prime Incorporated. Uh, he didn't work directly for Prime. He worked for one of the subcontractors under Prime. He drove for basically a Prime driver. And uh, he started out with just a regular lease truck, and he saved up, uh, I, I think it's like $15,000 down payment that you have to do to do a lease purchase with Prime. So he drove for a couple of months and put every penny aside that he made, and then he put $15,000 and did a lease purchase. And whenever he did the lease purchase, he got a Kenworth and he got every option imaginable. He said, he told me that he got it specked out with everything. Like he, every optional feature they, they, they had there on the piece of paper he filled out, he checked every box for everything. Um, but it was the most decked out Kenworth that you could possibly get. And he told me that his weekly fixed costs at Prime were over $1,800. I don't know. I can't remember exactly how much they were, but they were over $1,800 a week were his fixed costs. He did that for a month or two, and he quit, turned in the truck, and went back to being a CDL instructor because he said he wasn't making any money. He said that he was just breaking even every week. So that... That this is like, I'm not making this number up out of the, you know, just pulling it out of the air. 
These, this is the actual fixed cost of somebody that I know. So $1,800 a week fixed costs. We'll leave all the other numbers the same. I don't think prime drivers get as big a fuel discount as what we get. Maybe they get a bigger discount. I don't know. We're just going to leave it the same. So how much money would, uh, I forgot his damn name. How much money would he make doing this run? So all the total pay and all the rest of this stuff, all this remains the same. Let's get down here to net revenue. So running seven loads per week, the maximum number of loads that we can run per week, he would make $2,169.70 per week. That's not bad. Like he would still be making pretty good company driver money. There are company drivers out there that make $2,500, $3,000 a week. The, the high-end company drivers make like $2,500 to $3,000 per week. Those are the really, really good jobs. Like the UPS workers, $2,500, three grand a week. Your average line haul driver makes around $100,000 a year, which is roughly around $2,000 a week. So as an owner operator, he would be making about, you know, he, he would be making decent company driver money, which is about $100,000 a year, uh, two grand a week, um, you know, your standard line haul driver pay. What if this got cut down to five loads per week? He only did five loads per week. Well, he would only make $1,000 a week after expenses. He would be making 47 cents per mile profit. He wouldn't have any money to set aside for unexpected expenses. So he would have to do a minimum like even at six loads per week, what he's making is 61 cents per mile. That's just barely enough to pay himself. He's making $1,600 a week, which is mediocre company driver money. So he's just barely making enough money to pay himself so that he can pay all of his bills. He doesn't have any money to set aside for unexpected expenses. So at seven loads per week, He's making about 10 cents a mile. He's, make, he, he's making 70 cents per mile profit. If he's paying himself 60 cents a mile, that means he only has 10 cents a mile to put aside for unexpected expenses. The maintenance that we're accounting for here, the 11 cents a mile, that's just, you know, replacing tires as they wear out and doing you know oil changes and stuff like that that's all that 11 cents per mile is going to cover is replacing tires as they wear out and doing normal maintenance intervals there are you know your apu breaking down uh you know having a blowout on the side of the road and having to have somebody come out and fix that those are not covered in these expenses you have to make more money than this to cover those unexpected things and those expenses happen all the time. So $2,000 a week, it, it looks decent on paper right here until you start understanding the context of what's going on. This person is likely to go out of business running this load. Even running the maximum number they can per week of seven, this is basically a break-even load for them. They have almost no money to set aside for unexpected expenses. So all of the profit that they make is going to them and going to their bills at home, their car payment, their mortgage, their insurance, and all that stuff. They have almost no money to set aside for the business. So if any kind of unexpected expense comes up, they don't have any money for it. So this, this person is running on borrowed time and they would likely go out of business running this load. But because my expenses are so low, I'm able to put, what is that? 57 cents per mile aside for the business. That's more than enough to cover unexpected expenses. Like 57 cents a mile is going into my business you know, account, my business checking account. 
and just sitting there waiting for that $15,000 breakdown. So yeah, I can be profitable on this run. Let's look at something that's more middle of the road. $1,000 a week. Uh, you know, if you have like a $700 a week truck payment and then like $150 a week insurance and then ELD and stuff like that, $1,000 a week is really, if you have reasonable truck payments and expenses, then um, $1,000 a week is is really good. Like you're doing really well if your fixed costs, if you have a truck payment and your fixed costs are, are only $1,000 a week, you're doing pretty good. So can somebody with $1,000 a week fixed costs survive on this? Let's see. All right, at the maximum seven loads per week, they would be able to put 36 cents per mile aside for the truck. That's pretty good. Yeah, they could make it on this load. What if they were only able to do six loads per week? 31 cents per mile they could put aside for the business. Five loads per week, 23 cents a mile for the business. Four loads down to 72 cents a mile. That's, that's not really cutting it. So they would need to be doing an absolute minimum of five loads per week on this, but they could probably make it. Somebody with $1,000 a week fixed costs could make it on this load, running five loads per week. And if they were running seven loads per week, even better. But, uh, you know, they could do five loads a week, take the weekend off, and they would be running this 39 weeks. So how much would they make? So uh, if, if they ran five loads per week and then took the weekend off, they would be running 39 weeks per year. And they would be making the, you know, the gross pay is the same as what we looked at earlier, $211,575. What we're looking at that's going to be different is the net revenue. So what they would be putting in their pocket would be $116,000 a year. They would make $116,000 a year working five days a week, taking weekends off on this load. That's pretty good. Um, but out of that $116,000, there's going to be a chunk of that that's going to go to unexpected expenses for the business. You know, APU repairs, uh, roadside repairs, truck repairs, you know, buying equipment, tools, uh, replacing your mattress, replacing your refrigerator. The list goes on and on and on and on and on for business expenses. So what they're making here with this $116,000 a year, once you take away all the expenses that they would likely be paying for the business, they're going to be making less than $100,000 a year, which means that, yes, they could make it doing this load, but it would probably be better for them to just be a company driver and go get a line haul gig because they could do the exact same thing, work five days a week with weekends off at a line haul job and they would make $100,000 a year. They would probably make more after expenses than what they're going to make doing this. Uh, they would have less tax liability um, like after taxes and everything. Like basically in somebody in this situation would make more money being a company line haul driver than they would being an owner operator, but they could successfully do this and be profitable, but they would make more money just being a line haul driver. So yeah, uh, this load doesn't pay very well, but I can be profitable as uh, you know, with my expenses, I can make pretty decent money. And this is what I'm most likely going to do to ride out the really bad freight market. I'm just going to run this load to ride out the really bad freight market. And it's looking like the really bad freight market is going to last a long time because we've had very little capacity reduction. The reason the freight rates are bad are two. There's two reasons. The two reasons the freight rates are bad. Number one, we have too many trucks on the road. Number two, the amount of freight is declining. The freight volume is, is going down because the economy is going down. And we the, the rates have been going down for over a year, and there has been very little decline in truck capacity 
but the freight volume continues declining. There have been, back when the rates were at like all time highs, and let's switch over to my, just my fat head here. Um, and I'm, I'm gonna make this point and then I'll wrap up the video because I see that we're over an hour. When the freights were at all time highs, we saw a huge transition in the industry. A lot of people that were company drivers were becoming owner operators. And a lot of owner operators that were leased to carriers started getting their own authority. So we, we saw a huge amount of people going from company driver to owner operator and a lot of owner operators running under their own authority, moving from lease leasing to somebody to running under their own authority. Now that the rates are really low, we're seeing the exact opposite. We're seeing people that have their own authority shutting down their authority and leasing to somebody. And we're seeing people that were leased to somebody completely becoming, you know, shutting down being an owner operator and going back to being a company driver. So we're seeing a tremendous amount of movement of people like moving around, but they're still truck drivers. They're still driving a truck. They're still moving freight. As far as people completely leaving the industry and going and working somewhere else, being, you know, working at a restaurant or becoming an electrician or something, we're not seeing a tremendous amount of that movement. We're not seeing a lot of people completely leave the trucking industry. We're just seeing people moving between company driver, you know, owner operator leased and owner operator under their own authority. We're seeing movement between those three. Very little truck capacity lost. So the rates are still not at a point like there are people that are going out of business all the time. There are people that are completely exiting the industry all the time, but it's not a large number of people. And we need a huge reduction in truck capacity for the rates to come back up to a profitable level. Uh, right now, the average loads are either break even or below operating cost of, of most trucking companies. So uh, right now, everybody's feeling a lot of pain. Um, and I don't see any any end in sight. This is, you know, a couple of years ago when I talked about this happening, because I predicted this happening, I said the worst thing that could happen would be a slow decline in rates and a slow increase in expenses, because then people are just going to hang out forever. And we're not going to see uh, a significant drop in the number of trucks. It'll just be a slow decline that could take two or three years. I said the best thing that could happen is a, a, a sharp increase in expenses and a sharp decrease in rates to where we see a tremendous amount of people go out of business in a short amount of time. I said that is the best case scenario because then we will see a dramatic drop in truck capacity in a short amount of time and we will be able to correct in a short amount of time. We are in worst case scenario right now. It is a really lo long, drawn out, slow process and we're losing very little overall truck capacity. So I have no idea. At this current point in time, I have no idea how long this is going to last. There's a lot of things going on in the world that impact the freight rates, the freight volume, truck capacity, things like that. And I'm not sure what how you know what exactly all those things are going to do. Like the US dollar is um, losing a lot of its status on the world market as a trade currency, as the petrodollar. Um Inflation is out of control and the Federal Reserve is aggressively raising interest rates to try to curb inflation. Um, OPEC is cutting production to try to keep the fuel prices high. Our economy is tanking. I mean, it's just there's so many things happening right now. And I don't see an end in sight. Every a lot of the things that are happening right now are unprecedented. We've we've never 
that I know of been in this situation before. So it's really hard to predict what's going to happen. We've never been in a position where we're losing our status as the world reserve currency. We're in the process of that happening. We've never been in the position where the, the U.S. dollar has lost its status in the petrodollar and OPEC has started selling oil in other currencies. Um, we've never been in the position where we've had out of control inflation and raising interest rates as quickly as possible is not getting it back under control. Uh, you know, we have, whenever they raise interest rates, that reduces the amount of money in the money supply and it's supposed to cause the value of the dollar to go up. Well, we still see inflation, which is the value of the dollar going down while they're aggressively raising interest rates, which means that the value of the dollar the, the amount of money in the supply or the demand for the dollar is outpacing their raising of interest rates. So it looks like they're going to have to continue aggressively raising interest rates. And them aggressively raising interest rates is pricing people out of housing, it's pricing people out of cars, basically everything that you have to buy on loan that people don't have the cash to pay for. It's, it's, it's causing enormous declines in sales in those industries. And there's no end in sight on them raising interest rates. We could see like 15% interest rates again. Like I've never seen interest rates that high in my lifetime. I think you have to go all the way back to the 70s to see interest rates that high. Um, but we might get back up to like 15% interest rates. Uh, which is going to price a lot of people out of housing. It's going to price people out of cars. It's going to price people out of a lot of stuff. I don't know. There's a lot of unprecedented things that are happening right here. Like, uh, so I, I right now I don't have a prediction about what exactly is going to happen. All I can say with some reasonable certainty is that the bad freight market is going to last for a long time. We're looking at at least another year, at least minimum, probably closer to at least two years, unless some outside event happens, some some kind of event uh, that, you know, we can't predict, you know, unless something happens that causes a huge, um, you know, increase in freight volume, then rates are just going to stay low or continue declining for at least the next one to two years, minimum. And I can't think of anything that would cause a huge increase in freight volume. A war, potentially, like a major war. Um, I mean, there, there's a lot of things that could potentially increase freight volume. Um, if we put significant, like, let's say China invaded Taiwan and we embargoed China or severely sanctioned them, we are heavily reliant on products from China. We would have to switch over to getting those products from other countries or start manufacturing those products in the United States. If something happened to where we were cut off with trade with a major country like China and we had to spin up manufacturing in this country, that could cause a huge increase in freight volume because they would have to create the factories. Uh, they would have to start moving goods around like crazy. Um, yeah, it would, it would cause that. That's something that could do it. If, if China invaded Taiwan and we aggressively like embargoed or heavily sanctioned them and we had to start manufacturing stuff in the United States again, that could cause a lot of freight. I don't know. There, there's, these are things that you can't predict. So I don't know how long the bad freight rates are going to last, but it, the only thing I can say with certainty is it, it looks like they're going to last for a long time. I know that there's a lot of people out there that are just hanging on by their fingernails 
And they're just hoping that, oh, when we get to the summer, that's usually a, you know, a bump in freight. We're going to see the rates come up in the summer. Oh, the rates didn't come up in the summer. Oh, well, back to school. When people go back to school um, around August, um, you know, when the kids go back to school, there's a whole bunch of stuff that, you know, consumer goods that are sold, you know, for back to school. So maybe we'll see a bump in rates then. And then that doesn't happen. And then they're like, oh, well, you know, the holiday season, you know, we always see a, a huge rush of freight in the last quarter of the year for the holiday season. And then that doesn't happen. All these people hanging on by their fingernails, hoping for, you know, a bump in the rates, uh, an increase in freight volume. Uh, they're just going to keep hanging on, building up debt and eventually go out of business. Most likely. And we are going to see fluctuations in rates, but I don't, you know, the rates may go up a little bit. They may go down a little bit. You know, they're going to fluctuate. They don't just stay flat. They don't just go straight in one direction. And, you know, it's not, you know, freight rates aren't just like a straight line. You know, they, they have variation. So, yeah, we're going to have variation, but I just, I don't see any major bounce in the rates, any major uptick. There's, there's nothing to think that there's going to be any major increase in the rates for the next one to two years at this point that's that's all i can say so yeah i might be running this hobby lobby run for a very long time and there are times when this hobby lobby run isn't available for long periods of time and i might have to do other things because uh whenever i first contacted the agent on this uh you know like three or four months ago he told me that they didn't have any loads they didn't have any containers for like three months. Three months, the Hobby Lobby didn't have any containers. So now they have quite a few containers. Um, Hobby Lobby is probably taking advantage of the really low cost to move stuff right now. Because container prices are back down to like between one and two thousand dollars if you're buying them in bulk you might be getting them as cheap as a thousand dollars a container to ship a container overseas and then the cost to move a container on a truck is really cheap right now so hobby lobby is probably taking advantage of the extremely low cost to move freight right now via ship and via truck to fill up their warehouses now once their warehouses get full and they don't have any place to put shit and they don't have enough sales to move stuff out of their warehouses, then the containers are going to slow down again. But right now, it looks like they're just getting as many containers in as they possibly can. There's kind of a gold rush in containers. Um, just trying to move stuff as, as cheap as they can to fill up their warehouses. But once their warehouses get full, this is probably going to dry up. And it's probably not going to take long for their warehouses to get full because they're moving somewhere in the area of hundreds of containers a day just to this one terminal in Oklahoma City because the Landstar agent has 10 drivers a day shuttling containers. So 10 containers a day by just this Landstar agent. And this Landstar agent was told by Hobby Lobby that he has the highest rates out of anyone they do business with. So he's the last dog, you know, <laughs> to the bowl. Like he's the, we're the, we're the last in line to get containers. It's only after all of the other brokers get containers and they, they can't move any more containers with them that they give containers to the Landstar agent. And then on top of that, they have their own company drivers that shuttle containers back and forth. They only use brokers to move containers that are above what their company drivers can move. So I can only estimate that they're moving probably 200 containers a day or more from, you know, the Union Pacific Rail Yard in Dallas to the Oklahoma City ter Terminal. 200 containers a day or more, it's not going to take them long to fill up their warehouses. Um, so, I don't, I don't know how long this is going to last. This, this might only last a couple more months. 
and then this Hobby Lobby account could dry up and there might not be any containers available for two or three or four months. So, I don't know. Maybe I should stop sitting on my ass and I should get out there and get some money while I can because it could dry up and I might be forced to sit back at home again. Before we end this, let's... Let me pause the no. Let's let's click. There we go. There it is. Let's check the load board again. Let's do it by age and see what we got coming in here. So, man, we're at seven thirty a.m. and there's hardly any movement on the board. You look at these loads. This one's thirteen hours old, and then we got one that's two hours old. And then 40 minutes later, this load is posted. And then 15 minutes later, this load. Four minutes later, this load. And I don't know what time. This is a multi-load. It doesn't have the time. So there's, you know, a load being posted every five to ten minutes right now. Normally, whenever the freight market's doing decent, there's a load posted every couple of minutes, every, every, you know, one or two minutes. We're seeing five, 10, 15 minutes in between loads. So there's hardly any loads being posted and the ones that are being posted are cheap. El Reno, Oklahoma to Conyers, Georgia, 384 a mile. Max Wade has Matt. That's that's like a really good load. Even though it's max weight hazmat, that's a really good load for the current market. Let's see what other kinds of drama there are. Let me pause this. All right, let's try this again. That's the kind of stuff I'm talking about with this load board. It's just like logs you out all the time, and you click on something, and it'll take you to a different page. And it's really hard for me to make videos using this load board because it's so janky. All right, so I'm not seeing anything in here that's a red flag on this load. It looks like a pretty damn good load. Yeah, Atlanta is a good market. I mean, it's a max weight hazmat load. That's about the only thing negative about it, but it is paying a premium. Um, and loads coming out of the Oklahoma City area pay really, really cheap. So this is a horrible, horrible city to pull freight out of. So this is paying really well. It doesn't pick up until June 13th. So it doesn't pick up for five days. Now, it is not a direct customer, so this is some spot market load that they're trying to move. Which means that this rate could be completely fictitious. A lot of times, Landstar agents will just put loads on here that they have not negotiated the rate yet. This is what they're going to try to get. Um, this is the bid that they put in or something like that. But they put the load on the board because there's some rule with the agents where Landstar agents aren't allowed to bid against each other. So it's whoever gets the load on the load board first is the only Landstar agent that's allowed to bid on the load. So they'll just make up a number of whatever their bid is just to throw the load on the load board so that other Landstar agents can't bid against them. And oftentimes these, these spot market loads they're bidding on the, the, they're not going to get this. They're just going to get like half this price. So, I don't know. Everything they listed looks good. This looks like a really good load, but who knows what it actually is. So anyway, I should probably wrap this video up. Um, I can't think of anything else to say. It's a really long video, but I haven't made a video in a long time. I don't know when... I'm going to go back out over the road uh, and run that Hobby Lobby load. I'm trying to think. Um, 
I might try to head out next week. Today's Thursday. Maybe I will do some meal prep and stuff like that this weekend. Go out and get the truck ready to go Sunday night or Monday night or something. And uh, see about start running, you know, middle of next week. That's what I'm thinking right now. Is I might try to get get back out there and start running middle of next week. Um, my APU just magically started working. So if you've been following me, you know that my APU had two major breakdowns. One is everything that runs off the generator, which is basically the HVAC system stopped working, but the APU continued running. So it's still charging batteries. Uh, which wasn't a big deal because uh, I have that diesel bunk heater, the S-Bar or Wabasto. I don't know which brand I have. So I was using that to keep the truck warm. And the APU is just coming on to charge the batteries. Well, then the APU stopped running. It would turn on and run perfectly fine, but it wouldn't think that it turned on. It has some kind of uh, detector that detects if the APU is running or not. And it was not detecting that it was running, so it would kill it, start again, and then it would do an APU run check, not detect that it was running, kill it, and start it. It would just do that over and over and over again until it hit a crank limit. And um, I, I worked on the APU for like eight hours trying to figure out what was wrong with it. And uh, I couldn't find anything wrong with the APU. And I thought that it was probably the control board. Because the reason, the mechanic told me that the reason that the HVAC system wasn't working was because the control board, the CCU, the main control board, the something control unit needs to be replaced. And it's out of stock. You couldn't find one in stock. Well, um, then the second issue of the APU not working at all, um, is likely due to the control board as well. But while my truck was parked out there, it was parked for like a month and the batteries got so low that it shut off power to the APU. And it reset some breakers or something on the control board because when I went out there to uh, give the trailer to another driver, when Landstar had me go swap the trailer with somebody, I tested the APU and now the APU is running. I didn't go hook the HVAC system back up, but that's what I plan on doing next time I go out to the truck is to hook the HVAC system back up because the control board has several breakers on it that you can't manually reset. They're like big, like breaker boxes on it or something. But I tried to get the mechanic to drain power to try to get those breakers to reset last time I took it into the shop. And he did it, but he didn't do it properly. After he did it, another mechanic made the comment that he didn't unhook the capacitor. And with the capacitor still hooked up to it, it was still providing a charge. So he didn't reset anything. And the mechanic just shrugged his shoulders and did not do it again. That pisses me off because it appears that that fixed the problem. It was just, you know, disconnecting power um, from the circuit board allowed all the breakers to reset. So I think everything's fixed now, but I need to hook the uh, capacitor back up and see if that, that fixed it all. But um, I don't know. Hopefully it did. If not, hopefully a control board is in stock now. We'll have to wait and see. But... Uh, yeah, that's what's going on with me. We'll throw this video up here. Whenever it, you know, if I, you know, whenever I eventually get back out there and start hauling loads again, I'll, uh, you know, definitely start making videos again. But while I continue sitting at home, videos are going to be few and far between. So I don't know. Uh, hope you're doing well out there. Hope you're making it through this. Even though we need a lot of drivers to like exit the industry to correct this imbalance, you know, hopefully the good drivers make it 
and the bad drivers leave the industry because there's there's plenty of bad drivers that we, that we can you know we won't it's not going to hurt our feelings to see them leave the industry <laughs> so hopefully the good drivers make it and we lose a lot of the bad drivers this imbalance gets corrected rates go back up and you know we we can start making some money again um, i'm going to run a little bit harder next time the rates get good i can tell you that but uh anyway have a good one. Bye.